Hey everyone, welcome to the Get Your Life Together Girl podcast, the ultimate blueprint to self-love and inner peace. I'm your host, Danielle Van. As a cognitive behavioral therapist, a life coach, meditation teacher, and author, I've spent my life studying and learning from the stories that make us human. It's my passion and goal to help you shift your mindset and create a lifelong revolution to help you reach your greatest potential. We all know what a comfort zone is, and we all live within our comfort zones. But have you ever really thought about what a comfort zone actually comes down to? How it impacts you, or the fact that they're pretty much a dreamlike reality that we create to keep ourselves safe. It's boundary lines that tells us what we're willing to do and what we're not willing to do, and yet, Everything can be pushed and changed when it comes to our comfort zones. We're breaking that down today on a one-on-one deep dive, giving you the experience of how to step out of the comfort zone in a way we have never talked about before. So let's get right to it. The Get Your Life Together Girl podcast starts right now. All right, we've talked about comfort zones probably a million times on this podcast. Of course, that's an exaggeration. But I really want to break down how the brain works when it comes to the comfort zone and how we can get out of the experience of our comfort zone so that we can do more epic, cover the kids' ears, shit. Okay, it's necessary. We've all seen the motivational memes out there. We've listened to Nike say, just do it. We've even beaten ourselves up with the why can't I do this, you know, BS. So let's talk about what a comfort zone is. It's sort of this metaphysical experience that we have, and yet nobody really questions it. And so we're questioning it today, if that's okay with you. You know, I often, when I'm talking to somebody in therapy sessions, they'll say, you know, I need to do something that scares me daily. And I always look at them kind of funny, like I'm sure that's some great TikTok or Instagram advice, but why do you want to do something that scares you daily? Why would you want to run across the street with your eyes closed in oncoming traffic? Or why would you want to jump from the highest diving board when you're uncertain of how deep the water is. I want you to think about that. And while I realize that that thought process isn't really in the physical form for most people, and what we're really talking about is be awkward, right? Talk to the person that you're intimidated by, take the chance, take the opportunity. The thing is, if that scares the hell out of you, It is so counterintuitive to what you feel and are wired to do on a day-to-day basis. Remember, your brain's job is to keep you safe. If something scares the hell out of you, is it safe? Do you trust yourself? Of course, the answer is no. Your brain defines danger in quite a few different ways because of how we process danger and the different areas of the brain. But say like the chimp brain, like the most primitive fight, flight, fawn, freeze brain has us running on emotion alone. And it is designed to keep you out of harm's way. And it wants to turn on that fight mechanism to make sure that you can wake up tomorrow, right? And so if we're really scared, It's not safe. And yet there are those people who enjoy that scary feeling, that roller coaster, haunted house, movies, whatever it is. But understand that your brain is built for dopamine release and the chemical messengers of reward and pleasure and safety and sensation. If you're scared all the time, it's not actually working for you. It's working against you. Your normal brain thinks about intimidating situations, experiences in the limbic system, and it sends these strong chemical messages to try to convince the brain to stay the hell away from the experience. 
right? So I understand that the parts of the brain and how it all works doesn't necessarily do anything for you. But I want you to understand that everything that we do is built through three kind of you know, sociological and emotional daggers through the brain that we're really trying to get out of. And that is one danger, humiliation. You know, am I going to look stupid? Embarrassment? Am I doing this right? And this feeling of inadequacy. What's wrong with me? Am I good enough? And all of that plays into our comfort zones. Our comfort zones are first really built by our parents and the permissions that we were allowed to have. No, you can't do this. Yes, you can do that. It's this space that we put these, you know, invisible fences around and try to keep ourselves safe based on the rules that we were handed over. But think about it. If you're trying to avoid embarrassment or humiliation or inadequacy, We're going to create comfort zones as these fences that are really to protect ourselves so that we don't feel too vulnerable or exposed. And that emerges into behavioral habits. Again, back to what we were allowed to do, what we weren't allowed to do. The only way that a behavioral habit is either enforced or taken away is through action. You probably have had a lukewarm experience of this on a regular basis. And there's a name for it. I hear it all the time in session. It's called procrastination, right? So staying inside the fence of our comfort zone gives us this sense of security and safety. It is predictability. And when we procrastinate, what we're really doing is trying to stay in that predictability, in the comfort zone. And I want to really break that down because it's necessary if we want to go beyond what lies in that fence, right? The comfort, the safety, the predictability, we have to assume that it's going to be uncomfortable. We also have to assume that there's probably fear, there's probably failure, there's probably judgment by other people and ourselves. And under these circumstances, of course, we don't want to go into the path of the unknown. But instead, we have to realize that we have to do the things that don't necessarily feel the most comfortable to expand these imaginary fence lines. Let's talk about the definition of a comfort zone really fast. And that way we have the same kind of framework. But a comfort zone is a place, imaginary or not, or a situation where you feel the safest, at ease, and without stress. If we go beyond the comfort zone, then we tend to feel that lack of safety, that lack of ease, and the bubbling of anxiety or stress. Comfort zones are really this normal, adaptive response to the way that we process things and what we're trying to do again is to keep our inner peace and every single one of us does it, right? Comfort zones also are actually helpful. I know it sounds like I'm all against them, but they are actually helpful because they do help us create habits and routines. They help us keep the daily life going without having to do too much. Our brain really loves autopilot so that we don't have to make so many decisions and comfort zones help us get into autopilot, okay? So they're not totally horrible, but we do want to be able to admit that there is a flawed thought around comfort zones and how we show up can be pushed just a little bit. Okay, so if we're in agreement of that, let's move forward. And let's think about the fact that these fences, these comfort zones are really just figments of your imagination. They are all the stored processes, the memory, and the places that we say yes and no to. And they're motivated again to keep you alive, to get you out of discomfort, to increase your pleasure. And this is a big one, to protect your ego. Protecting your ego is a form of safety. Now, 
I want to say this, because these fences keep us in the same behavioral habits, because again, we're going to do the things that take us into safety, ease, and a lack of stress, we tend to then go into full autopilot, and it's sort of this mental cruise control where we can get really complacent and bored and we have little shifts and breakthroughs of happiness and self-awareness and mental toughness, but then we shift right back into boredom and lack. And this experience tends to create this overall dissatisfaction of our lives. And this is the place that we start talking about needing to get out of our comfort zone. Okay, so let's talk about some practical strategies. You need some ground rules to make you comfortable with feeling uncomfortable before we begin to shift the comfort zone and make the what once wasn't familiar an okay experience. So let's talk about some ground rules. I need this to be something that you walk away with because if you don't, then you're going to have a hard time shifting your comfort zones. And a lot of people will argue with me, totally okay, let's have a good conversation. But I always say this, I actually do not believe in failure. And if you want to be comfortable in the uncomfortableness of life, you also need to recognize that actions can fail, but people don't necessarily fail. They're not failures at life. They take actions that don't necessarily work and therefore things shift or they sit stagnant. And that's important to know. Truly, I think one of the biggest misjudgments in life is that people equate a failed experience or a plan with being a failed person. You're not a failure. It's a critical point to understand that sometimes our thoughts are not well thought out. Sometimes the plan has things that we can't foresee coming into the space. And the only time that we really fail is to sit stagnant and not do anything. But again, that's an action, not a character trait. You know, do you learn from the times that things don't work out or do you simply ignore them? Failure itself is simply giving up when the consequences don't work for you. If the consequences aren't really life-threatening, it's kind of easier for the brain to say, let's keep going, as long as there's not a lot of negative self-talk. I want you to think about the fact that if you face the adversity, if you get okay with the failure idea, saying that I may actually have to do a little bit more preparation or be a little bit more adaptable or be a little bit more resilient to my experiences, then that will give you the ability to push that zone just a little bit. So recognizing, this is sort of the ground rule, right? Number one, recognizing that actions can fail. We have to be okay with that. That doesn't mean that I myself am a failure. That is a necessary thought process to push the boundaries. The next thing is that you have the ability to reframe your goals and intentions at any time. If your comfort zone requires you to do something new, to force your goal, you really want to be in control. And so we have to realize that when we start something new, there's a lot of control factors that maybe we haven't considered, right? So when our goal is under our control, we get to define what success looks like. We get to fail on our own terms. But if our goals require other people to comply, we're kind of already in trouble and we're sitting in discomfort. Think about that time in school or maybe in your business life where you've had to do something with other people and they had to do X amount of work and you had to do X amount of work for everything to come together. And the goal is based on everyone's effort. And yet maybe someone doesn't do their work. And so we're all uncomfortable. We're having to push the line, get into things that we weren't really necessarily prepared for. But that is a form of pushing the boundary line. It's okay to reframe goals when we are uncomfortable. Let's talk about the third rule 
that is also extremely important when we're talking about comfort zones. And it is trusting the snap decisions, that intuitive answer. Instead of beating yourself up in the head mentally 5,000 times trying to come up with an answer, so often the first answer is the right one. But we let our fear and our concerns linger. And when it does, they tend to create the space of not being able to make a decision. And sometimes it's good to be impulsive. Sometimes that I dare you, make a good decision, be in the future part of yourself is okay. It's a win-win for your brain because it tells you that that comfort zone isn't dangerous after all. When you commit to something very quickly, now I'm not talking about something that is, again, life-threatening or something that has this major life impact. You do give yourself biofeedback that says, I have the power to make a decision for myself regardless of what may occur. Now, I don't want you to confuse this with, say, getting in the car because you think you can drive after you've been at the bar or buying something that you can't afford or trying to do something that has a major impact on your life. I'm talking about these small little wins, these snap decisions that make things work for you. If you can really lean into those three things, realizing that you're not a failure, actions fail, people don't necessarily fail, that you can reframe your goals and your intentions and that snap decisions are not the end all be all most evil thing ever, that you can listen to your intuition, that it's a win-win for your brain. Let's talk about how to escape your comfort zone in a way that will have you pushing your own boundaries and hopefully making an impact on your happiness, your enjoyment, and even your potential. So step one, in all of this is to choose which comfort zone you want to bust out of. Okay. Sometimes we have multiple comfort zones. We don't look at it like that, but think about something that really keeps you from enjoying your life to the fullest. And then think about that in a way that it needs to be confronted. If you have no desire to leave your comfort zone because it's trivial, and it doesn't prevent you from reaching a goal, it's not really that important, right? You can leave it the hell alone. But if there's something that has an undertone to it that keeps you from fully engaging, that's the thing that needs some focus. So think about all the situations you currently avoid or you currently put off that procrastination piece that I was just talking about, and then get down to why. If you have denial about how the impact may be, it's time to really think about things. Ask yourself questions, you know, like in 10 years, what are the things that I wish I would have done differently? And then think about how you can circumvent that right now. See what you need to push through. Think about what is within your grasp, but you're not actually taking full command of and put it on a piece of paper. A lot of people have about three to five comfort zones that they secretly wish that they want to break free from. So get that on the page. List them one through five, one through three, whatever it might be. I want you to list out those comfort zones. For some people, when I talk about comfort zones with them, they'll say, you know, I'm not comfortable dating. And so I don't put myself out there, but yet I'm really lonely. The lack of dating is the comfort zone that's holding you. So think about that. How are you being impacted and what's keeping you small in a box? The next step is to start by watching. It really helps you to reduce your stress of any intimidating comfort zone by first being an observer instead of a participant in the situation. So think about it as a way to toe dip into your behavior, right? You're looking at what's going on from the inside out. Think about the risk of embarrassment. We talked about those three things that we're trying to prevent 
when it comes to our comfort zones, whether that's humiliation, embarrassment, or inadequacy. What are we trying to avoid? Whatever it is, we need to get down to just the facts and challenge any false expectations, any false truths, any stereotypes that might be challenging you in the comfort zone. We can't change what we do not observe. And when we observe it, that gives us the ability to participate in a new habit. A great first step to simply watch is to step back and see it from a different perspective. How is this impacting me? How is this holding me in place? What can I do to change it? Watching is such a powerful tool that we do not utilize enough. And it does feel a little strange when you're the one watching yourself, but it does make great strides in being able to change the behavior. Step three is a little different. And it's, it's one where I often tell you, don't forecast, don't burn down your life. But here I ask you to forecast a little bit, and that is to pre-create the fear. When you start thinking about leaving the comfort zone and you're faced with all those feelings bubbling up, instead of trying to control the thoughts and the feelings, sit in them, right? Sit in it. Allow that fear to come up. Allow the scenarios that are imaginary to bubble to the surface. It may feel very crazy in your mind, but guess what? It works. It actually helps you to create an effect of being desensitized from the stress. It's a great way to manage anxiety too. And then it's also a way for you to be able to look at any pitfalls that may come up from the stepping out by pushing the edge of the comfort zone. It helps you to sort of take a mental time travel to worst case scenario and then back it back up into reality, which is step four. We'll talk about that in just a second and be able to get out of the irrationality of fears. And it helps you create a mental and even physical contingency plan. Now let's go to step four. I just mentioned it and it's to deconstruct the scenario. With the scenario fully imagined and the mental movie sort of played out, you're able to look at and evaluate the comfort zone in its entirety. We moved through all of the pieces of the comfort zone just by looking at what do we want to take away? What comfort zone do we want to bust out of? And then stepping back and watching it from an outside perspective. And then creating the fear of what it looks like if we walked out beyond the lines that we have created for ourselves. And then we deconstructed it and brought it back to the truth. This is a really important thing because then we can then do step five, which is to take the plunge. Breaking through the barrier of fear is a huge deal. The dopamine hit that comes from completing a previous insurmountable task or goal makes everything unbelievably clear. Resiliency, strength, being able to be confident, and most importantly, it helps you redraw the boundaries of what you think you're capable of. This is that push that push out of the comfort zone. As a baseball mom, I think some of you that have listened to the podcast know that my son is a fairly elite baseball player. And one of the things that I love that one of my girlfriends, another mom on the team says to her son is win this one. And she says it when he's up on the mound pitching and I've adopted it because it is such a powerful statement. Win this one. That's what taking the plunge does. That's what nudging the lines, the plane of the box does. It's winning this one thing. I told you, let's look at five comfort zones that you want to squash, that you want to change. And when you do it, you're winning that one. Earn that one. You can anticipate the fear. You can consider all the outcomes. You can convince yourself that there's something more for you in the moment. A dopamine hit, an experience of joy, 
There's positive things that are coming when you become someone who bust the comfort zone. Take yourself into that experience. It can be intimidating to want to change things that previously owned you. But the truth is, that is the experience of life anyway. Change. So you can apologize for wanting something more or you can do something more. You can say, I don't have the ability to do it or you can test the ability to do it. Everything that we're doing is about developing, about changing, about getting better, about moving in some direction. If you say that you can't, you can't. The comfort zone is a self-imagined box. Are you sure you want to put yourself in boxes? Yeah, I think I know the answer. And so the next time you find yourself stuck, ask yourself, am I sure that I'm actually stuck? Or am I feeling like I need to push my boundaries? Because when you push, this is the ultimate step into getting your life together. Thank you so much for listening to the Get Your Life Together Girl podcast. If you've enjoyed these tips for bettering your life and are seeking daily inspiration and additional tools and tips, follow me on social media if you're not already. I Get Your Life Together Girl on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Clapper, and now Threads. You can also visit my show notes and my blog at my website, getyourlifetogethergirl.com. Please also feel free to share this episode with family members and friends as it helps spread this message to those who need it the most. Until next time, be kind to yourself and others.